If you find on watching and listening to my section on the early stages of literati painting, that is, Shirdafu Hua or Wen Ren Hua, um, later Wen Ren Hua, if you find that I sound less enthusiastic than some other people who have written and talked about this subject, and if you want to hear more in that same direction, get my new book titled Pictures for Use and Pleasure Vernacular Painting in uh, early Qing China, in High Qing China, sorry, uh, published by the UC Press and uh, just recently out. And read the opening pages where I talk very much on the same matter, raising questions about why we have accepted literati painting theory so unthinkably, unthinkingly. Um, the book is worth buying and reading, by the way, for other reasons too. The picture has beautiful pictures and is nicely designed, and I need the royalties. Anyway, as we Continued through these later lectures on this series on the Imperial Academy painting of the Southern Song period, um, which the Chinese literati tended to scoff at or play down or consider low class. Uh, you'll find me taking the opposite view on that, too. And on the whole, arguing that uh, we shouldn't remain so bound to old orthodoxies as we have been. As I write in my book, in other areas of culture, we don't continue to uh, honor the self-promoting rhetoric of male uh, elites. So why we go on honoring this one in China, I, I really have no idea, but I'm raising the question. What about all the rest of China? What about all the people who were not members of this male elite? Um, but that's an attitude of mine that I've gone on throughout my career, and it's led some people to charge me with not respecting China. <laughs> well, <clears throat> my, edit, my response to that you can see on my website, under Responses and Reminiscences, number 7375, on Respecting China and what I learned from Joseph Levinson. Those are both, by the way, on the handout. I am showing as I speak, and without comment, sections of hand scrolls of calligraphy by Mi Fu and Su Shi. Now, the beginnings of literati painting. Um, you can, I, I give various readings in my handout beginning with my old article, Confucian Elements in the Theory of Painting, uh, delivered as a symposium paper in 1958, published in various places, I give references there. And then I have references to Susan Bush's very good, on, very good book on literati painting, Chinese literati on painting, 1971, and um, Wenfeng Section, the scholar official as artist, in a book of his, and so on. Um, okay. The 11th century, the picture we're talk, the period rather we're talking about now, uh, up to the beginning of the 12th century, is a period of peace in China, peace with the northern neighbors. Ketons had been pacified, and it was a productive period in lots of ways. There was a great flourishing of Neo-Confucian philosophy, for instance, uh, great poetry, perhaps the greatest age of Chinese poetry after the Hai Tang. Uh, a great Asian politics, certainly. Books and books are written about that. A marvelous book by Peter Ball, B-O-L, and Harvard, anyway. Some, um, this, this culture of ours. Some of the greatest statesmen active in this period, Ouyang Shu, I quoted, Su Shi, we'll look at, and others. Some of them were almost like, ideal examples of the scholar, gentleman, official, or Shi Dafu, in China, which is a type that is, becomes highly idealized and is imitated by endless, endless, endless people afterwards. These men were poets, calligraphers, collectors, connoisseurs, and painters now. Uh, about their paintings, there are not many preserved. I'll show most of them and talk a lot about them, I'm afraid. By contrast, in later lectures uh, for the Southern Sung Academy Masters, I'll show a lot of paintings and talk relatively little. Uh, anyway, we have to say a lot, I'm afraid, so put up with it, please. Anyway, Su Shi or Su Deng Po. Now, for him, we have two, well, let me speak about him first. Uh, we have two paintings uh, uh, which I can show as likely works of his, and uh, they'll, they'll go on uh, together or one after the other, okay? Both of them representing uh, old trees, rocks, and bamboo. Okay, Su Shi was a famous poet, statesman, calligrapher, as a painter, he specialized in a small group of subjects, bamboo, old trees, and rocks. He painted in ink only, not color, painted simple pictures, pictures that are like an extension of calligraphy, 
which was very much by choice. His choice of subjects was partly symbolic. All these subjects, bamboo, old tree, rock, symbolized the virtues of the ideal man, as did other subjects that they take up, uh, blossoming plum and so on. But also, they were chosen because they suited the limited technical abilities of the amateur artist. His friend Mi Fu, whom we'll come to in a bit, wrote about him, quote, Su Shur painted old trees with their branches and trunks contorted excessively, like dragons, while his wrinkled and sharp rocks were queerly tangled like sorrows coiled up in his breast, end quote. Well, the images in painting, then, are seen in terms of human character and human feeling. How very different this is from Jing Hao, for instance, in the 10th century, who wrote about an old pine tree, quote, as though soaring aloft into the air, its gestures like those of, of a writhing dragon, end quote. Um, for him, that is, the old tree had its own inherent nature, its own expressiveness, its own character, and wasn't simply a vehicle for the uh, expression of the artist's uh, inner, inner, act, inner uh, life and so on. Well, the, the question of how forms embody feeling is a subject for a course in aesthetics, and I can't talk at length about that. If I were to give such a course, I would use as at least one of the texts Suzanne Langer's 1953 book called Feeling and Form. Uh, I don't think anybody, very many people read it now, but for me it was very influential and persuasive and so on. Um, Writing and lecturing about this phenomenon in the 1950s also, I was tempted to liken it to abstract expressionism, which was then current among uh, painters in the U.S. Well, this might have been misleading in some ways, but not totally, because the idea of expressing feelings in forms apart from any representational function that they may have uh, is common to both traditions. Otherwise, of course, they're very different. Okay. I've quoted before, and I'll quote again, a Su Shur poem about earlier artists. Though Master Wu Daozi was supreme in art, he can only be regarded as an artisan painter. Wang Wei soared beyond images like an immortal crane released from a cage. Well, before I go on to talk more about his theories, let me just get back to the paintings. Okay, we have, as I say, two horizontal pictures, both parts of hand scrolls, really. The one, the, the, the first one here, uh, which I showed first, has uh, the tree indeed queerly twisted, uh, like the sorrows in his breast, beef who says that was a rock, rocks anyway, um, but expressively, not, not, but not the way a tree grows. And the rock looks really more like a clamshell, maybe, than like a rock. And a little bit of bamboo and a little bit of grass down below. Well, no, no attempt at space or really convincing volume or really rock-like texture to the rock, um, but expressive and somehow powerful in its way. This picture, by the way, is, um, is uh, Whereabouts Unknown. It was published in a good reproduction way back in China, and then it was uh, reproduced by Seren and others, Seren mainly, and we all knew it from that, and nobody, as far as I know, has ever seen the original painting, if anybody knows where it is, you know, we'd like to know. Um, it has colophones by Mi Fu, his close friend, whom we'll talk about in a minute, and uh, other uh, early writers. So it's, it's, it's quite convincing, and people reproduce it as the work of Su Shur. The other one, next please, here, this one, uh, is in the Shanghai Museum, and in this, this is badly damaged, by the way, and much retouched, and as you see, it has seals all over of collectors and um, the tree wanders uh, a lot, <laughs> much more than it could in real life. It couldn't, it couldn't be supported, in other words, but, and um, uh, twists around and so on expressively. Little, little bits of bamboo growing from the ground and a kind of rock, it looks more like an earth mass here. Okay, these, I say, are the two paintings that people generally accept as by Suchur. And as, let me put beside one of these at least, this painting, which I'll I bring back, I showed it in the first lecture, and we'll see it again in a later lecture, attributed to an artist named Chu Shi, but really just anonymous, mm, early northern Sung maybe, I don't know, I've, I've variously dated it, late 10th, early 11th century, from the style of the rock and so on. Well, this is also bamboo old tree and rock, actually the old tree is blocked out here, this picture's not 
complete, complete. Some uh, some part on the left is missing and has an old tree there. But at any rate, this, if you talk about lightness, this is it. This is uh, extraordinarily, uh, as I, I've said numerous times, almost photographically uh, lifelike uh, picture of bamboo growing and uh, showing how the bamboo was damaged by the uh, by by weather and wind and winter cold and all the rest of it, it extraordinarily sensitive and uh, what uh, understanding view of bamboo growing. Well, this is the opposite extreme. If you talk about likeness, which Susser now is being quite uh, uh, dismissive of, this is what put Susser meant as likeness. Now, as I was also said at the beginning, and will say again, if any cultivated Chinese had the choice between this picture attributed to Xu Xi, which is in the Shanghai Museum, by the way, and in the same museum, the hand scroll that includes the picture of the, this wandering tree, um, they would immediately choose the hand scroll, choose the Su Shi. And the picture, on, on the other hand, attributed to Xu Xi, has come down to us with virtually no, no, no um, notice at all, no seals, no inscriptions attached to it, and so forth. Unappreciated. Okay, getting back now to Su Shi's writing. Let's hear, let put on a piece of Sucher's calligraphy, just to uh, include, because uh, he was a major calligrapher. Okay, <clears throat> he was talking about how Wang Wei was imp superior to Wu Daozi because uh, he uh, was a scholar artist, essentially, or he was a uh, literatus artist. And then he goes, uh, another of uh, Sucher's sayings is much quoted, goes this way, quote, when one savors Wang Wei's poems, there are paintings in them. When one looks at Wang Wei's pictures, there are poems, end quote. So Xu Shi sets out to make painting and poetry sister arts or equivalents, one of them virtually interchangeable into the other. And this is again a subject endlessly, endlessly elaborated by literati writers and others. Poems are paintings and sound and so on. Okay, um, I'm not going to do that. I could write a whole book, and it would be a very dull book by my view. Okay, some people are much more... Okay, well, can you do all that? Now, also endlessly quoted from uh, Sucher is there this this uh, this couplet. Quote, uh, this is in the Bush and Shore book and so on, opening lines of a, a poem. Quote, if anyone discusses painting in terms of formal likeness, his understanding is close to that of a child. In other words, if you talk about painting, whether it resembles the thing it represents or not, uh, then you're talking like a child. Well, that's, that would be what would happen if you, if, uh, as I say, one put it beside the Shu Shi painting, as I'm doing, and if one uh, pre preferred the Shu Shi, then he's, he's being childish. Well, as I remarked in the introductory lecture, uh, say, and any cultivated Chinese is going to choose the Su Shur, and Su Shur's writing has just been endlessly, endlessly persuasive. Nobody has, it's never been seriously questioned, in fact. All of this, in fact, this uh, literati uh, theorizing has a very great attraction for lots of people. As I've come to realize in recent years, certain positions or arguments have a rhetorical advantage over others. That is, if you talk about sudden enlightenment, in Chan or Zen Buddhism versus gradual enlightenment, obviously everybody wants the sudden. And in fact, it was only the adherence of so-called sudden enlightenment that formulated the issue that way. The <laughs> gradual enlightenment people obviously wouldn't. Uh, it doesn't mean that one side is right and the other one wrong. It means that this one has a, a rhetorical advantage over the other. The literati claim these rhetorical positions that uh, were advantageous Paintings with poetic content obviously sound better than paintings without poetic content. Expressive painting sounds better than other kinds and so on. It doesn't mean their kind of painting is really superior. So look at the paintings, make your own judgment, and so on. Uh, finally, Zhu Xi, uh, a, a late a late Northern Song uh, philosopher, wrote about wrote about Su Dong Po, quote, After a hundred generations, when people look at this painting, a painting of bamboo and rock, they will be able to see him in their minds, end quote. So this is an early statement of the belief that would be endlessly repeated later, like all the things I'm talking about. When you look at the painting, that is, you don't see the bamboo and the rock, you see the man, the man who painted it. 
uh, you understand the workings of his mind. And this is the idea that I traced in my Confucian Elements article. In fact, that juicy quotation was at the end of the article. Before going on to look at the next artist, I insert here another painting attributed to Su Shur, a hand scroll with an inscription signed with his name. I think it's at the far end, on the left edge, but it's unclear. Dedicating the painting to a certain Xin Lao, or Old Xin. There's also a longer and more prominent inscription written to the right of this, an appreciation of the painting and its artist with a date corresponding to 1334. The hand scroll is painted in ink on silk and again shows bamboo growing by rocks, the familiar clamshell-shaped rocks, but this time with more believably growing bamboo, no old tree, and with the whole set in a misty space indicated by a few touches of landscape above and beyond. This scroll belonged to a certain Dung Ta, an intellectual and writer, one of those who were imprisoned and destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. His collection is kept now by the Chinese Artists Association in their great exhibition hall, the Hui Hua Guan, located northeast of the palace in Beijing. I was shown some of the collection by special arrangement, but I was not allowed to make slides, and I can only show you these images made from a reproduction. This scroll looked to me like an important early work by a close follower, more skilled than Su Shur himself, able to make his painting more spacious, more believable as a picture. It may well be the work of a Jin Dynasty artist, none that is in the north during the Southern Sun period. Anyway, it's important as Link, one of the few we have between the early stage of literati painting and its revival in the early Yuan. Now we go on to another another painting. We've talked a lot about, about Su Shur without really having much to show. A close friend of his uh, who wrote admiringly, Su, Su Deng Po wrote admiringly about Wen Tung, that is, uh, Wen Tung, a bamboo painter, a more serious painter and probably a better painter than Su, Su Shur himself. Wen Tung specialized in bamboo and established a school of ink painting and bam, ink bamboo painting. Uh, he died young and, um, well, and, uh, many paintings are attributed to him, but there are only a few that seem plausible. And this is the one most often reproduced and probably best accepted. This is a large branch of bamboo in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. It's not signed, but it has a um, uh, seal on it with the artist's name. That doesn't mean it's necessarily the artist's seal. It may have been put on later. But, um, um, and then more uh, inscriptions mounted above on um, paper. The painting itself is on silk, as you see. Well, okay, uh, let's put beside it uh, over here, and no, no, we can go in and see it closer in a uh, of the painting only. This S-curve design becomes mm, standard, really formulaic in bamboo painting. It's used endlessly by many, many painters. And the idea of spreading the bamboo twigs and leaves out over the surface of the painting to form the design is the basis of, of ink bamboo. And uh, other other matters that uh, other techniques you can see here the way of drawing the segments of the bamboo and the bamboo joints, and uh, the way of arranging the leaves. Now let's go on to the detail. Here's here's a detail. Bring it uh, bring it closer. Are all become uh, parts of a uh, a manner, a school, whatever of painting bamboo, and and because it can relatively easily be learned, it uh, is taken up by many many artists. It can be easily turned, that is, into a formula. It's not a formula here. It's, it's still probably something new and to its viewers somewhat exciting. Well, you see that if you, if you get up into the detail, the leaves, uh, it's not as flat as it looks at first. That is, there is some uh, shallow depth, and it's achieved by having lighter leaves which go back, and the darker leaves stand forward. Well, you remember in my first lecture, maybe it was the second, no, the first lecture, the... Uh, um, the uh, no, second lecture, the, the one on Han, the, uh, the two tripods, one drawn heavily and coming forward, the one drawn lighter going back. This is something like that, really. That is shallow depth achieved by uh, light versus dark. And then the you see also, when you get in closer, the more calligraphic and interesting drawing of the twigs and so on. The twigs are drawn off in the little hooks at the ends of them. This is like the hooks you sometimes find in, in uh, calligraphy. Um, 
Okay. Um, as I say, this, uh, this is not a strikingly unorthodox painting, but it's a, an early example of a kind of paintings that would endlessly be repeated by, uh, by amateur artists who could do it fairly easily. And here it seems more fresh and new and quite strong. Okay, then the next, here's a little album leaf, a double album leaf folded in the center um, with a signature, again, over on the left here, middle left, which is maybe questionable. I mean, the artist probably isn't going to just write one tone like this. If he writes it all, he's going to write more and he's going to do it in calligraphy. But at any rate, it's a very fine and early example of bamboo painting, even less conventional than the one we just saw. Here, more of spontaneity and the uh, uh, the leaf patterns uh, somewhat less formulaic and, um, and, and even more perhaps a, a sense of real depth and interestingly somehow individualized the, uh, the bamboo stalk is broken you see up at the top and bent off to the right as if broken by the wind. Uh, bamboo normally is seen as uh, bending without breaking. This is part of its uh, human-like virtues, but in this case, it's uh, it is it's broken. But anyway, so this is a, uh, a but the hand of the artist, if it is one tongue, uh, the hand of the artist, whoever it is, is very evident in the painting and beautifully evident, and it's it, one enjoys it for that as much as as an image, although it works quite well as an image too. The main mass of leaves here in the upper left is behind the behind the stalk, and, and generally it has, I say, more depth and more variety than the uh, than the other, and uh, uh, a, a bit more spontaneity. But still, it follows a system highly controlled or disciplined. Brushwork in literati painting is never allowed to become too loose or free. Okay, the next. Now, I want to put in here. This is the painting that most most uh, people are talking about one tone are probably not going to include, but I want to include. This is uh, the first half of a hand scroll in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, obviously just made from reproduction, uh, very badly damaged by worms at some point. That's what all the white things are. That's the uh, mounting paper, uh, mounting paper uh, sh showing through from the back. And uh, representing, actually a uh, re re representing uh, autumn in the river valley, but representing a scholar recluses uh, living in reclusion. And it's a type, it belongs to a type that I write about later. I'll, well, let me talk about that as we go. Anyway, here at the beginning, uh, uh, this is, uh, it's attributed to one tongue and it's uh, believable because uh, there are paintings from later periods that uh, uh, copy parts of this, and they are said that the, the art and the writer, the, the artists, uh, uh, present them as copies after one tongue. I mean, of course, that it's believable as a copy after a work by one tongue. Of course, it isn't an original painting by him, but it probably preserves an important composition ascribed to him. Here at the beginning, you have a uh, river shore, and over at the left, some pine trees and a little rest shelter underneath, a tingza, and then uh, people arriving in a boat perhaps to moor on the shore. In other words, it's, um, uh, it represents uh, passage out from the landscape traveling somewhere else. And in the second section, here, here, the next please. In the second section, we have a very fine early example, the earliest known to me, of a um, type that be, again becomes, as I say, very uh, common, and that is the uh, the recluse lands, uh, landscape in which the dwelling of the scholar recluse, here you see it in the very center, he sits in the upper room seen through the open window uh, surrounded by trees and then turn and turn surrounded by high cliffs, all, uh, all sheltered as though he is enclosed when he wants to be and uh, sheltered. And then down here below here on the left, uh, lower left, there's a boat uh, moored, which means he can move out when he wants to. So this combination of shelter when you want to be away from the world and uh, and uh, access to the outer world through uh, boat travel and so on is becomes the ideal uh, scholar, scholar recluse landscape. And in numerous, numerous examples are painted in the Yuan Dynasty and later representing particular peoples 
reclu recluse, uh, reclusive dwellings. Okay, now we go on then to another of the major artists of the literati, uh, earlier literati school, and this is Mi Fu. Mi Fu, not by the way, Mi Fei. It used to, in old books, you'll find Mi Fei, but that was a misreading. It was corrected later by, so it was Van Gulik who corrected it. Okay, Mi Fu, 1052 to 1107 are his dates. And um, he was a another uh, major figure of the time, a scholar, professional connoisseur, a calligrapher, major calligrapher. We'll see calligraphy by him. And a major collector. He held various posts. For a time, he was a member of the Hanlin Academy, the Imperial Academy. He was appointed as a connoisseur in the palace and advisor to Huizong. He probably took part in the compiling of the catalog, the Imperial Collection Catalog, Tren He Huapu. Mi Fu wrote, a, wrote quite a lot, actually, but uh, two works in particular, Hua Shi and Shu Shi, literally History of Painting and History of Calligraphy. But actually, they're not uh, co uh, co cohesive or coherent uh, histories so much as collections of brief commentaries, stories, anecdotes, often very unorthodox opinions about old painting and old calligraphy. Uh, my good friend and colleague Kohara, Hironobu Kohara, has just published a major study of the Huasher, uh, uh, in which he translates and interprets and uh, studies of the writings of the, of the, of, on painting by Mifu. Uh, they, they include judgments of earlier artists and so on. You can find quite a lot of it in Bush and Scher's book, pages 213 to 14. Okay, but as a painter, and also I should say, uh, Mifu was the subject of a book by Peter Sturman. Peter Sturman, who teaches at UC Santa Barbara. He took his master's degree and doctorate at Yale University, working with Dick Barnhart, and uh, did his disser dissertation, I'll speak later, on Mifu's son, Mio Ran. But he wrote this book, Mifu, colon, Style and the Art of Calligraphy in Northern Sung China, Yale University Press, 1997. So major uh, writing on Mifu. There's lots and lots of other writing. Uh, anyway, now Mifu as a painter considered himself to carry on the a Jiangnan or Yangtze Delta local tradition. Um, he um, uh, recognized that as a southern tradition of landscape, and he traced it back to Dungyuan in the 10th century, who in fact was indeed active in the area of Nanking, Nanjing. Um, about landscape painting, Mifu, Mifu wrote this, translated Marilyn and Shan Fu, Studies in Connoisseurship. Um, quote, likeness of subjects such as oxen, horses, and human beings can be gotten by imitation, ma, uh, imitating, copying. But landscape painting cannot be achieved by this method. Landscape painting is a creation of the mind and is intrinsically a superior art, end quote. That's a profound statement, I think, uh, and it's true. Uh, certain kinds of things, you can look at them and paint them or depict them, from what you see. I mean, an artist skilled in doing that can do it. But landscape isn't like that. At least landscape has done in China. The Chinese never went out and painted actual scenes from nature. Uh, they were always studio painters. They could go out and sketch from nature, but they didn't uh, paint particular scenes. And um, anyway, uh, the, 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 so landscape is uh, a, a creation of the mind or a construction of the mind and in, intrinsically a superior art, as I say, a very fine uh, important statement. <clears throat> now, there's no, I have no reliable painting by Mifu to show you. This one is in the Freer Gallery. It's old and important. It's commonly used to represent him. It's a painting in ink on silk, as you see, somewhat damaged, but still relatively well preserved. I don't think there's a, a signature as I remember, but the writing in the upper right, uh, way up in the upper right corner, is uh, a couplet to two um, four-character uh, lines. And uh, I remember standing in front of this with, um, with uh, Zhang Da Chen, uh, the great uh, painter, forger, etc. I looked at a lot, I spent hours looking at paintings with him. It was marvelous. I learned a lot. Uh, he told me that this is the hand of the Emperor Huizong. So it's meant to be, and maybe after. Huizong's um, uh, uh, draft script, or 
uh, running script rather than his fine slender gold script. And what it says is this, couplet, Heaven sends down timely rain, hills and clouds put forth mists. Well, this is a political statement. That is, uh, uh, politicians or uh, officials are supposed to bring benefits to the people in the same way that the timely rain brings benefit to the farmers, saving their crops and so on. So uh, paintings of this kind of misty hills and such with inscriptions of that kind are given to officials to praise them as people who are benefiting their their uh, <clears throat> subjects. Okay, the people they're administering. Uh, anyway, leaving that aside, that's a big, big subject. And read, I have a thing on political themes in Chinese painting, in landscape painting, which you can read. At any rate, <clears throat> here's the detail from it, uh, closer up, um, of the Freer painting. Silhouetted tree groves, as you see, against mist or fog, um, and um, a few temple roofs seen here in the slightly upper left, a bit up, a bit left of uh, upper le above and left of center, but very few and no paths, no figures. I don't think uh, if they're there, they're lost. Well, now I see what it looks like figures. Maybe, maybe they're originally figures and they've sort of faded away. At any rate, nothing much of uh, that kind of. Uh, detail. It's um, instead just uh, trees and mist and that's about it, and hills. And all of this represented, as you see, in uh, uh, it, through application of dots or little dabs of ink, um, rather like stippling. And these come to be known, in fact, as me dots. Me dots because they're used by me fu. And everybody knows me dian, if you say median, everybody knows what you mean. Okay, here, uh, here's, by the way, a piece of uh, Meifu's calligraphy, quite fine, in the Shanghai Museum, signed in the center here, and with a boldly written date over on the left. Here's a painting, uh, a part of the painting attributed to Dungran, the, um, uh, the one crossing the river, and in the Shanghai Museum, and the, um, um, uh, the trees and the Hills above are, as you see, done very closely. Here is a detail from it, uh, done done very much in dots, dotted, and along with some other kinds of painting. But the me, me dots uh, derived from this is, is pretty clear. Uh, and then here is a detail from the, uh, the next piece, the, from the uh, another painting attributed to Dungran in, the, in Japan, uh, Kurokawa collection. And this is blown up. Mifu, Mifu praised Dungren's paintings as, uh, as he pointed out, you have to look at them from a distance. They, are, they don't have a lot of detail, you can look at close up. And his own paintings are the same way. They're meant to be seen from a distance and to merge, the dots merge together into, um, into um, uh, hills and mists and so forth. There are other landscapes attributed to Mifu, but I don't Think of I don't see they're worthy of considering. There's one a little landscape that's in the Chinese Art Treasures exhibition, which is obviously later, and that they don't tell us much about the Mifu, so I'm leaving them out. Well, we should remember, looking at Mifu's landscape, that it was Mifu who pronounced the landscape by Xu Dao Ning, the painter of the Great Hand Scroll and Nelson Gallery, probably, which I talked about at length. Xu Dao Ning talked about his painting as quote plebeian, not worth looking at. He was very scornful of quite a lot of earlier painting. Uh, Mifu's influence on Huizong, or at least uh, Huizong's complete swallowing of the whole literati painting ideal, is indicated by Huizong's rejection of Gua Xi. Gua Xi was not that much earlier, really, and who had been an academy painter and highly praised and uh, direct, uh, the, dominating the academy. Uh, mid, this mid-12th century writer Deng Chun tells about how his father was serving in Huizong's court and looking through old functional paintings and he sees a mounter using a Gua Xi painting as a rag to wipe up a table, wipe off a table, um, unmounted painting I assume, and so on. So uh, Deng Chun's father asks whether he can have this painting and Huizong or somebody anyway tells him, you know, yes, take a whole bunch, and they, they deliver a whole cartload of paintings to his house. 
gouache paintings, my God, and they're hung all over the walls of his house. Well, if we wonder why only one gouache survives, or maybe a few more, we don't know. At any rate, uh, the, 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 this kind of contempt for uh, paintings that were once considered great has something to do with the failure of certain things to survive, alas. Okay, anyway, so much for Mifu. Let's go on to his son, Mio Run, uh, from whom we have quite a bit more, so we can talk more about Mio Run's paintings. Uh, Mio Run dates your 1074 to 1151. He lived, that is, into the Southern Song period, into the middle of the 12th century. Here, the, uh, again, Peter Sturman has done the major writing in English. His doctoral dissertation, Mio Run and the Inherited Literati Tradition, Dimensions of Ink, ink Play, uh, Yale University, 1989. A massive work, three volumes, 530 pages. Unpublished, alas, as far as I know, should be published. I, I was a reader for it and praised it highly, though, so rightly. Okay, I mean, I was very much impressed by it. Uh, Mio Run was a precocious youth. He followed his father as a landscape painter. He was only 22 years younger than his father. Uh, he had a career as a minor official and served in a pre prefectural post for a time in charge of a school of writing. He held office again after the establishment of the Southern Sung, after the Northern Sung had fallen, after Hui Sung had, etc. And for, lived, uh, for 24 years, he lived into the Southern Sung, and so he played an important role in the continuation of literati painting past the Northern Song, continuing it into the later period. During the last 10 years of his life, we read, he met with imperial favor, as the emperor favored his painting, so that he painted less for outsiders. And in fact, there is no dated work surviving from me around from the last 12 years of his life. Okay, here we're, we start with a painting, which is in the Cleveland Art Museum, and uh, as Cloudy Hills Along a River, dated 1130. Uh, let me just read a couple things that uh, Mio Run writes about painting before we go on to talk about his paintings. Here we go. Uh, <clears throat> he writes this. Yang Shung, that's a Han Dynasty philosopher, Yang Shung considered written characters to be the depictions of the mind. As for the definition of painting, it is also a depiction of the mind, in, or the heart or the mind in China. In the past, everyone who was of an exceptional talent worked in this way. But how can the common commercial artisan be expected to understand? Question mark, end quote. Well, it is an expression of lofty superiority and contempt for the opposition, uh, which is common in literati writings. And this also in Bush, both of these are in Bush and Shore, and they are all references in my handouts. Quote, people know that I am good at painting and compete to obtain my works but few realize how I paint. Unless the eye of true perception is in their foreheads, they cannot perceive it, and one cannot look for it in the paintings of ancient and other modern artists." End quote. Well, it's obvious that literati artists who are able to write about themselves in ways that earlier painters couldn't, or at least didn't, um, because they are literati after all, it's obvious that they don't avoid self-praise, quite the reverse. Like Su Shur, Mio Run is taking stands that have a rhetorical advantage, as I would see it. And lots of people, including most specialists, still are persuaded. Sturman writes early in his dissertation, quote, Determining how Mio Run turned painting into an art of expression is a major task of this thesis, end quote. Well, that's a perfectly fine statement. And it was indeed what he and his teacher Wen Fong and the whole school was very much devoted to doing, to uh, putting forth literati painting in its early phases and doing serious long studies of the major works and the major writings. I was once similarly persuaded in my early career and did a lot of translating and, and uh, publicizing and so on for literati painting. Now I have come to be more skeptical about the effect that literati painting theory had on the whole history of Chinese painting. There's a lot that was bad along with the good in its effect through the severe criticism and censorship of the opposition. A great deal was lost, but I'll talk more about that when we come to the Southern Shang period. Anyway, this painting in front of us now, this is the whole hand scroll from reproduction, uh, Cloudy Hills Along a River, dated to 1130 in the Cleveland Museum of Art. 
It's very plain scenery, simple hills, uh, nothing seen close up, uh, much like the painting of his father, a little bit more detail, uh, river and trees among the hill, among, uh, excuse me, houses among the trees and so on. Um, well, this is the earliest painting we have, by the way, with a poetic inscription by the artist. The next, please. Here's the beginning of it. And you can see here a, boat, a man and a fisherman in a boat at the beginning. Clouds which are somewhat like archaic uh, clouds, but not outlined as firmly as Wang Shun, for instance. But otherwise, very much like his father's painting. And next, please. Here's the uh, following section. And in the upper left, you see his writing. Okay, this is the earliest painting we have that has a poetic inscription by the artist, and also the date included. Older masters, as you remember, only signed their works, if that. Very few of them did that, and um, Yen Wen Gui signed his, uh, Fan Quan signed his, Guo Xi went so far as to add the date and title. But now the artist writes big and uh, you know, occupying some space in the upper part of the painting, adds a poem, invites admiration for his calligraphy and his pro poetic composition, as well as for his painting. As a picture, as I say, this creates, this presents a kind of deliberate monotony, almost like his father, uh, not quite as much, but anyway, uh, avoiding interesting detail. Uh, another painting by him, next please. <clears throat> this one, Mountains and Clouds, former Abe collection in the uh, Osaka Municipal Museum now. This is the painting that I um, chose for the Scarab book because it's, I think, more interesting than most of his. In fact, it's a painting I really, really like. <clears throat> uh, up above is, a, is a, an inscription by him dated to 1134. And um, it's a, uh, a painting characterized by deliberate vagueness, uh, suggestiveness, dissolution of solid forms, um, creating a sense of mystery. In the middle right, a band of fog through the trees, obviously derived eventually from, you know, uh, Zhao Lingrong. And uh, then above, then on the left, more, more trees and so on. But um, And uh, the clouds which turn from the um, Zhao Lingrong-like um, fog to hard-edged clouds as you go along from left to right. And then rising above these, some very strange and interesting mountains. Okay. The question of whether the, um, and then he, he writes in the upper right here, playfully done by, by Yuan Hui, or that's his na is the name he used. So the question of whether the painting and the inscription up above it, which includes a date, originally belonged together, is discussed at length by Sturman, who ends up saying that they probably did. Sturman makes a long and complex and interesting argument about how the painting might have been done for a friend, which means he would include private allusions to old styles. He would assume some kind of understanding of the friend that would allow him to be elusive, to, uh, to refer to old styles in a way he wouldn't and something done for just everybody. So, and Sturman argues that it may be referring to Li Chung of all people. Well, it's an interesting argument. I don't, I don't take, I'm not taking sides one way. I'll be non-committal. Arch Wenli, my, uh, the director of the Freer Gallery, used to have a saying, interesting if true, <laughs> which he would use on occasions like this. So I, I, I will say that, interesting if true. Here it is closer up, and you can see better the, there's no spectacular brushwork, nothing showy, nothing, uh, nothing obviously skillful, but through this very soft brushwork and big, large den or dots down in the lower part here, uh, he builds up, as I say, a landscape that is really quite evocative and somehow moving, and which I find, as I say, more interesting than most of his works. Okay, going on to look at another. Here, uh, a work in, the, in, in China, probably the Palace Museum in Beijing, if I remember rightly. Two sections of it. Uh, here, is, it's more mist than usual, lots of mist, in fact. In fact, only a few things, roofs of houses and so forth, and bits of trees showing through the mist on the tops of mountains or hills, and one of them with a pavilion on the top of it. Oh, a, yeah, not a pavilion, a, uh, uh, anyway, pagoda, tall pagoda. Okay, um, you do see these often in China through in, in the distance because the Chinese like to build them on the top of hills. Okay, so then um, 
this is, um, as I say, probably in the in a collection in in uh, China. And here's another another section of it, with um, uh, yeah, more fog, more mist, and a, a, a few a few buildings, tops of buildings. Okay. Um, uh, and then here's another one, which is also, I think, in in uh, China, also the Palace Museum in Beijing, with an inscription on it, which is, well, self-praise. My ink plays, the qi on is definitely not usual or something, something, and uh, not easy to achieve. So, okay, he's, he's, he's praising himself again. Here in the center is, is a, a section even more clearly derived from Zhao Lingrong. Well, artists could perfectly legitimately uh, borrow from each other, use motifs from other painting. Uh, as I say, when it becomes somewhat intellectualized like this, originality is not really so much to the point. And uh, it's not what you are after when you buy the, or when you acquire the painting. Now then, okay, here, finally, this is not a very good slide, and I apologize for it, but it's all I have. This is a, painting, a section of a painting called A Rare and, Wonder, Rare and Wonderful Views of the Xiaoxiang. Dated 1137, again in the Palace Museum in Beijing. Sturman considers this his finest extant work. Uh, I, but I don't have good slides and I can't make that argument. And he may well be right. At any rate, <coughs> I should say something about the Xiaoxiang. A series of eight views of the Xiaoxiang region had been painted by a late 11th century scholar painter, Sung Di. And it was taken up as the scholar painter's poetic subject. Uh, Xiaoshang are two rivers, and properly the phrase should refer to the confluence of the rivers, but actually it refers to a, a whole region in Hunan, uh, near a great lake where uh, the scenery was misty and beautiful. Freedom Merck writes, well, a wonderful book about uh, views of the Xiaoshang. Uh, I, there's a reference to it at the end of my, uh, my readings of this lecture, something definitely you should read partly as a corrective to my own <laughs> my own somewhat more skeptical writing or talking sometimes about literati painting. But anyway, um, this picture is supposed to be the Xiaoshang region by Mio Ran, but if this is hmm, if this is uh, poetic, a uh, new height of poetic painting, it's so by a different definition than mine. And my lyric journey book, by the way, argues that uh, the, the heights of what I would call poetic painting by my definition, are achieved rather by the academy artists, such as Xia Gui in the Southern Sun period. But that's a quite different argument. Anyway, read that if you want to. It's a two, two ways of thinking about poetic painting. Mi Ren's paintings, anyway, came to be greatly in demand, just as later in the late Yuan dynasty, mid-14th century, the paintings of Ni Zan. Ni Zan became so popular, so famous, that everybody who aspired to a reputation for good taste had to have one. It was said that you, the refinement or vulgarity of a family could be determined by whether or not they owned a needs on painting. Now, something like that is happening apparently in the southern, in the early southern Sung, uh, for um, um, for uh, for Mio Ren, and everybody needs to have one, um, and so he, he they're, they're hugely in demand. He painted a lot of them. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, these, they were poetic versus the vulgar works of painters like Guo Xi, as you understand. On the other hand, there's a late Sung writer who's quoted by Sturman who writes this, quote, 1,000 Miyo Ran paintings all sing the same tune. I have a certain sympathy with that. Uh, he, 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 he produced a lot of them, shall we say. Okay, the next, next then. Now we come to a, um, an artist who's in some ways more interesting. Li Gong Wen, 1049 to 1106. Li Gongwen came from Anhui, uh, Anhui province, or what, Anhui district, and um, uh, from a family of scholar officials. He passed the Jinchu exam, which uh, led to official appointment. Uh, he held various offices, uh, and he retired after 1100 to a mountain villa in the Lungmian, or Dragon Sleeping Mountains. He was well enough to, off to own this big piece of land and to have his mountain villa where he could retire, as Wang Wei had done in the late Yuan, or in the, late in his life, that is, in the Tang Dynasty, as you remember. Li Gongwen was himself a collector, 
like the others, say an expert on old paintings and calligraphy. He was friendly with Su, Su, Su Shur and Mi Fu and the others. And he painted, he's best known for painting figures in what's called the Bai Miao style. Bai Miao meaning literally uh, white drawing, but drawing an incline, fine line, fine even line generally, without any color or wash. And this is possibly somewhat derived from old Buddhist sketches and such that these artists knew. At any rate, it's a, it becomes a distinct style and one for which uh, Li Gunglin was known. About his paintings, Li Gunglin himself wrote this famous statement, quote, I make paintings as a poet composes a poem, simply to recite my feelings and express my nature, end quote. Well, this is a conventional sentiment for his time, as we've seen. And... Uh, it doesn't really match up very easily with his extant paintings, at least to my eyes. He seems to have been, on the contrary, a more serious painter and a more technically accomplished painter than the others. Okay, such, so, so it would seem from the paintings we have from him. Now I begin with uh, two sections, which is all I have, from the, from the hand scroll titled Five Tribute Horses with Grooms. This is presently not only a collection unknown, but it's unknown whether it derives or not. It was owned by a famous Japanese sta uh, scholar, uh, statesman collector, Yamamoto Tejiro, uh, then by his widow, presumably, and then it was reported destroyed, but the belief of some is that it wasn't really destroyed. She was keeping it quiet for tax reasons. And at the time of a great exhibition years ago, uh, somebody, some Japanese, of uh, uh, Tokyo National Museum the official was said to have seen it, and they were going to borrow it, and then, it turned, and then they didn't get it after all. Anyway, that's quite a long, complicated story. Whether it survives or not, we don't know. Anyway, Five Horses and Grooms, it was reproduced and photographed in Beijing in old days, so at least we have pretty good photographs. And um, it um, has inscriptions by Huang Tingjian, his friend, dated 1090, and others. So it uh, has a really good pedigree, and has been generally accepted as Li Kung Lin's work. Uh, <clears throat> horses and grooms, as you see, here's one of them, uh, the groom wearing a uh, official cap showing his rank and so on, and uh, the robe, and quite beautifully drawn horse, dappled, uh, walking. Um, okay, uh, next please. Here's the groom walking uh, with a tethered, I mean, a tethered horse and a harness, and a white horse walking. Uh, a date in the upper right with a with a Sung, a Sung Dynasty uh, text, Shao Ye Ball. This is supposed to be the famous uh, white horse that was owned by the Tang Emperor, also painted, as you remember, by Han Gan in a famous painting that I showed at length now in the Metropolitan Museum. Okay. Anyway, this is this is a this is a painting no longer known or extant uh, attributed to Li Gun Lin. Now here we go. If you like horses, oh boy, I've got horses for you. Horses and horses. This is a um, um, long, hand, not so long, but quite uh, a remarkable hand scroll in the Palace Museum in Taipei, excuse me, in Beijing, uh, which is titled Pasturing Horses. And it's a copy after a painting of the Tang Dynasty by an artist named Wei Yan. We don't have any genuine work or even other good copies after Wei Yan, but he's recorded. And uh, this painting is in the Palace Museum in Beijing. It's ink and colors on silk. And this is the first section of it, maybe the first half or so. I have quite a number of uh, slides. I won't show them all, and I'll show them rather quickly. But uh, the, the main thing to say about it, as you see, is that it's an extraordinarily detailed painting, uh, which uh, represents, uh, uh, somebody's counted them, 1,286 horses, 143 men, mostly mounted. And according to the inscription, uh, Li Gunglin painted it on imperial order, by a, for the for Hui Zhong, that is. The writing in the upper right here, the title may be in the hand of Hui Zhong. I'm not clear on that. <coughs> the long inscription in the center, you can ignore. That's this 18th century emperor who wrote all over his paintings, but I won't talk about that. Anyway, pasturing horses after Wei Yan. And here at the beginning, you see this enormous herd of horses being driven through the landscape, pastured uh, by uh, by grooms. Uh, it, uh, uh, the next place. Now, the fact that it's after a Tang painting, 
is reflected in the composition. This idea of spreading the elements of the painting out over the whole surface up to a high horizon is very much like Tong. The, uh, the, the use of the, of the groups of figures to make mass, masses or, or a, a strong design is like Tong. The fine drawing is like Tong and so on. So um, yeah, here you can see the variety of horses, uh, every possible kind, and also the variety in the people. The next, please. And then further on, here is a section uh, with a, uh, a jutting mass of rock in the foreground and a pine tree slightly left of center here. And then the horses going back, uh, seen up over the rises in the ground. That's another old feature in paintings like a painting I showed attributed to a Liao artist following Tong practice. You see rises of land and things partly seen uh, over the over this, cut, partly cut off by the landmass. That's all very old fashioned and must have been true of the original, which of course is long lost. Here to remind you is the central section of the hem scroll ascribed to Hu Huai or Hu Gui, the Liao Dynasty artist, uh, which I showed before. And the composition is, as you see, clearly related with the elements spread out over the surface, some of them seen over rises of land, stretching back to a high horizon. The next, please. Yeah, here a little closer. You can see the horses are indeed highly individualized and uh, different colors, different postures, different kinds of horses, everything. And the, the achievement of doing this, of making them uh, that many horses, that many all different, was really quite an achievement. Uh, you, here, now we come in close, you see this jutting mass of rock with the trees on it. And the rock uh, clearly is uh, after some mass, uh, a mass, a rocky mass of the Tang Dynasty with a slanting top and uh, sides um, block-like. You remember how, how Tang Dynasty rocks were sometimes drawn, drawn, drawn like a child draws a block. Well, something like that lies behind this. The next place, here beyond, going a little bit further. Um, trees, uh, excuse me, the horses coming out from behind the uh, landscape farms, wandering into the distance, playing with each other, uh, and so on. And or sometimes looking out at us. Here, here's, here's a, a great close-up detail. Now you can see the horse, the horse turning to look out as if at the viewer. Um, well, how much actual understanding of horses it represents, somebody else can say better than I. I once was praising it, and somebody in the audience, who actually it was Joe Levinson's wife, wife uh, Rosemary, said, actually, Jim, it's a very bad drawing of a horse. She knows more about horses than I do. Well, that's up to you to decide for yourselves. But at any rate, the sheer task of having so many different kinds of horses here in another detail. Um, you remember there was a painting that I showed in a lecture on, whether it was on Tong or I think it was on Tong, yeah, uh, which was called, uh, which was meant to be a kind of manual for painters of drawing horses, which showed horses in every conceivable or almost every conceivable uh, co color and shape and type and posture and all the rest. I've read all the things you want to know about the horse, so to speak. Well, something like that lies behind there. Sheer taxonomy, uh, classifying, uh, multiplying types. Okay, then next, please. Uh, here we, uh, we, we see the grooms who are driving them. And the grooms are also interestingly differentiated. Different clothing, different ranks, uh, different postures, obviously. It's just it's an extraordinary achievement to paint the uh, a subject like this and, um, and keep it from being terribly dull. Going in close again, here, next please, a detail. The uh, groom with his stick raised, uh, hitting the horse on its flanks, and another horse behind, and another groom, and so on. Uh, extraordinary drawing, and if you think of doing this on silk, uh, and on, on such a, sub, on such a uh, scale, and doing it all, how many sketches would you have to do? How many, uh, how, I mean, avoiding any mistakes? You can't make a mistake painting on silk. You can't cut the piece out and paste a new one in or anything like that. You can't go over it as you can in European oil painting. You have to get it right and get it absolutely right as you go. This is extraordinary, Being you can do it. Well, uh, the uh, uh, this, this uh, ability to paint a large 
number of something with uh, not quite repetitively but all the same kind of thing and make an interesting pattern out of it is something Tang Dynasty artists were obviously very good at. Uh, Japanese artists pick this up from them and use it in some of their great emaki or picture scrolls. You can imagine the, the burning of the Heijo Palace, something like that. Masses of samurai or masses of whatever it may be, riders, uh, making a mass at the same time interesting, a pattern uh, that's more, more than a pattern. Okay, uh, this, is, this is a real achievement and we have to respect Li Gun Win uh, for being able to do it. Here, close up here are the mass of people, same way, differentiated by uh, age and uh, all rank and all kinds of things, different caps, different uh, postures. Okay, enough. Uh, close up showing here, showing the faces. They're uh, facing in different ways. You have to, as I say, imagine trying to do a picture of this scale and with this many figures and somehow make it all interesting, even with a model behind you of the Tong artist. And here, finally, a detail of the some of the grooms napping or sleeping uh, resting under trees. Uh, okay. Very fine drawing of an amazing work. Now something entirely different. Here we go to, um, um, to um, a painting called Dwelling in the Lungmian Mountains. Lungmian means dragon sleeping. As I say, this is where Li, Li Gunlin retired in his late years. Well, this was a hand scroll. The original is presumably lost, but there are several old copies of it. And this is the subject of a uh, very serious study and major study by Robert Harris, Bob Harris, to Cotiz at Columbia University. Uh, his book is titled Painting and Private Life in 11th Century, uh, Mountain Villa by Li Gun Lin, Princeton, 1988. <clears throat> well, okay, uh, I, I would certainly refer you to this book if you, I won't have a lot to say about these. I, I don't have a lot to say, but there are several. Uh, major uh, early copies of it, and they agree in, in some respect, disagree in others. Anyway, very complicated thing. Um, one of the copies, uh, sets of copies, in, this is the former Berenson collection in Satanyano, owned by Harvard now, uh, another in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, and still another in the Palace Museum in Beijing, which I know only from uh, photographs I got from, from Harris. So I'll show the excerpts from all three. This is from the Berenson version, which is on silk. And it's, uh, I guess, presumably the first I image in the scroll. And it shows the whole layout of the Lungmian uh, mountain villa uh, with all its various uh, sub-compounds and so on. And uh, it's more map-like than picture-like, as you see. And in fact, it's Japanese, Chinese, excuse me, Chinese picture maps are indeed done this way with often the hills seeming to, uh, uh, to push outward from a center, central map-like part, and you see them pushing upward at the top, rightward at the right, and downward at the bottom, and so on. So this is an old, old convention, not more, more, uh, more map-like than picture-like. And in fact, the painting generally has, in some ways, is, is more diagrammatic than uh, pictorial, and that's deliberate. Here is a sec another section from the uh, from the uh, Berenson scroll, and here in the center you see a man standing on a uh, mountain road, another one off on slightly to the left, gazing at a waterfall, and then below down to the right here, a little compound, two of them actually, uh, of houses surrounded by fence and trees, terribly and deliberately out of scale with the figures. So this, as I say, uh, makes it somehow more diagrammatic than pictorial. Another from the Berenson thing. Uh, what the painting shows much of the time, there are people, presumably Li Gung Lin himself much of the time, and his friends enjoying the uh, sights and sounds and uh, water courses and so on of the Lung Mian Villa. Here they're sitting by a waterfall, and uh, as I say, I'll talk about about uh, viewing the waterfall when I come to Southern Song Painting, which often reproduces this. And they're accompanied by servants, and they're, they are living the elegant life and the life of reclusion, the recluse scholar who gets away from the world by living in his, in his villa. The next, please. <clears throat> okay, here is a section from the, from the uh, 
uh, from the from the version in Taip Taipei. Uh, this is ink on paper, rather harsh. Actually, the original is not quite so harsh. The pictures are harsher than they should be, and um, um, the same the same thing. The, the the man gazing at the waterfall over here on the left, and friends, including a monk here on the lower left, and uh, various the the trees are done in an old tong like fashion, which we've seen also in other archaistic pictures, separate, uh, distinguished by different foliage patterns, but very flat. And similarly, the rocks, as you think, these jutting rocks are very much in Tang style. So it's evocative of old styles. Actually, there were models or semi-models in the Tang dynasty, the famous Wang Wei picture, a set of pictures of the Wang Chuan Villa, where he retired, or a, um, a series by an artist named Lu Hong, uh, which uh, survived 10 views of a thatched cottage, it's called, survives in a copy in the Palace Museum in, in Taipei. This is in uh, Chinese Art Treasures, number four in CAT. Well, all of, this, all of this, the wildly incorrect scale, the deliberate archaisms and all the rest of it, are seen in pictures like that. And Li Guanglin takes this up now and recreates this, not as a picture of his mountain villa, but somehow identifying his re scholarly retreat uh, with these great uh, famous retreats of, of scholar artists of the past. And it's a, it's, it's a big claim, but it's, a, it's perfectly legitimate. He, did, he was a major artist and he did have this retreat and so on. And he must have been well enough off to entertain his friends there. We see them here in a cave, a group of them, and we see them enjoying a small waterfall here and so on. Uh, the, the landscape, next please. The uh, villa must have had in it uh, strange and wonderful uh, what uh, geological phenomena like this thing, rather rainbow-like forms at the right here, like another cave. There are writings, uh, uh, inscriptions written throughout the painting, right in with the landscape. This is, is not the kind of landscape that's going to be uh, hurt by having writing in it. And as I say, you see Li Gunglin and his friends throughout it, or his servants planting trees, for instance. Here, any de detail, you can see closer up. The pet figures are drawn in his well-known bimail style, that is, ink line, and the clouds are done in this archaic manner. And the landscape, well, you can't say too much because these are copies, but apparently done in this built-up landscape manner, of ink, uh, brushwork over brushwork. And here, and also from the uh, Palace Museum Taipei version, this passage with the figure standing on the, uh, on the um, path, and then down below this little tiny compound, the house, uh, very deliberately impossible uh, scale relationships and so forth. Okay, the other version I'll show very quickly. I have only photographs from Harris, but you can see this is, this is rather harsh, how much the harshness is the photograph and how much the it's from uh, the, the original. I don't know, I haven't seen the original, but it's another version and it's uh, uh, the same kind of highly schematic forms, highly archaistic forms here and again. Here is um, uh, Lee Gung Lin and his companions reenacting a, uh, a gathering that happened way back in the Sixth Dynasties period. A monk and his friends who got together. I think that's what's happening here um, on, on Mount Lu. Something like that. At any rate, there are allusions, allusions in the painting, and everybody who sees it is supposed to be cultivated enough to recognize them. And the painting uh, uh, provides all these rich, rich uh, allusions to uh, sort of stimulate the imagination and memory of the people who see it. In that way, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful series of compositions. As landscape, obviously, you, you can't believe in it as landscape. That's something else. Here's a, another final section with a waterfall. Okay, enough for that. Now we go on to see another major work of Li Gung Lin. Uh, this one, very probably a genuine work. At least I would accept it as that. <clears throat> this is the classical filial piety in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, acquired by Wen Fong years ago through his uh, relatives and eventually presented to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, if I understand it right. 
uh, a major work of Lee Kun Lin, uh, rather damaged but repaired by a wonderful mounter in Kyoto. Uh, that's, that's another long story in itself. Here, at any rate, um, uh, and written about, in this case, mainly by, um, <clears throat> by Richard Barnhart, who, um, whose book, Lee Kun Lin's Classic of Filial Piety, Yale University Press, 1993, with essays by Robert Harris, Zhu Hui Liang, and others. Barnhart also had an earlier book on the thing, but it published in 1979, and after his dissertation. Okay, um, the um, so so what we have here is a hand scroll made up of of the scenes illustrating this classic of filial piety. Filial piety we talked about in the Sixth Dynasty period. You know what that is? Doing things that were uh, respectful of your parents and so on. It's a great Confucian virtue. This is the kind of hand scroll where the um, paintings and the and the calligraphy, both by the way by Lee Kun Lin, he redid the writing as well as the painting. Uh, they are set off, uh, not not merged, not though the inscription that is are not merged in with the painting in any way. They're set up very clearly by double lines that run the whole up a whole vertical distance from the top to the bottom of the scroll, as you see. Uh, and the, 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 uh, they're successive. And it, as you can see here, that it started out as uh, with lots of holes and, and patches and damage and so on. Uh, all right, okay, already you, you see it's a kind of painting with uh, bimal figures um, uh, scattered over the surface and uh, something, de deliberate archaisms again, the same kind of thing, not as extreme as the Lung Mian, which mountains. Okay, here, and I've got a series, I have lots and lots of details, but I'm only going to show a limited number or two of this important scroll. Okay, here is a uh, section with, I don't know what the stories are, I haven't gone back and tried to uh, match it up with the text as one easily could do with Barnhart's book or other sources. Liga of Wenfeng has also published this at length. Uh, here, anyway, uh, some major figure uh, bowing down or to, uh, meet, meeting someone else who bows lower. The one in the center is obviously the, ma the main scholar gentleman and his two attendants and then behind a garden rock and bamboo drawn rather more schematically than he could if he wanted to, so to speak. And then behind that a quite uh, lovely little passage of uh, geese and reeds. Okay, and here's a detail from the two figures. The, uh, the figures, drawn not completely fine line, there's a little bit of swelling and thinning in the line, but basically it's like by mail. Um, and very, very sensitive, fine drawing, classical in every way. And here another section <clears throat> in which a scholar gentleman, the important figure in the center, who wears a cap and sits in importantly in a chair and is larger than the others, is receiving some kind of supplicant or someone bowing down to him and looking very, rather pained. And around the main figure are his servants. This is a scene in his house. Behind him a screen with a landscape on it, which gives us a bit of Lee Kun Lin landscape, rather simple as you see. Uh, hills and uh, river shore and trees. Okay, then coming in closer, here's the figure, the figure of the man. And again, we see that it's not completely uh, fine line, but very sensitive and very thoroughly controlled drawing. He turns his head, next please, here in the close-up detail. He turns his head, he looks down at the figure, he reaches out to him with a very beautifully drawn hand, and um, um, really ex very expressive of the ideas behind the, the, uh, the ideas in the text. So ex uh, very effective illustrations, a fine example of uh, the best kind of literati uh, figure painting as practiced by Li Gong Lin. I'll do one more. Next, please. The, uh, <clears throat> I don't have slides of the whole, but just as an example of the many, many uh, very fine works in the Bai Mao manner attributed to Li Gong Lin. You know, one could put, bring together a huge book of them, actually. But uh, this is just an example and a very good example. This is in the Palace Museum in Beijing. <clears throat> and it's a scene of the famous confrontation or disputation between Vimalakirti and Manjushri disputing. Vimalakirti was an old sage uh, Confucius, uh, Buddhist, and uh, he had a famous 
argument with the Bodhisattva Manjushri. I'm not going to do the story, but it's in one of the sutras, and it's just very well known anyway. And uh, Manjushri, Vimala Kirti, in some, to some degree, bests the Bodhisattva. Anyway, and always you see the two of them. There, there are illustrations of this at Dunhuang and elsewhere early. This is attributed to Li Gunglin, and it could be, I guess, I don't, I don't have an opinion one way or the other. It could just be some other very good painter. Here, Vima Akirti is a sage old man, sits always off at the right, and sits on a mat and raises his hand, two fingers, in the gesture of teaching. The Buddhist uh, mudra of teaching actually is like that. And uh, he carries a fan, he holds a fan loosely, and his robes swirl around him. Next, please, let's go on. Here is the um, close-up of, uh, of uh, Vima Akirti. Very sensitively drawn face. Well, this kind of painting is obviously a technical skill. It's probably more probably as some specialist, maybe academy master, rather than an amateur like Lee Kun Lin. But um, very fine. I say there are many paintings of this type. Here, uh, uh, next please, a, uh, a maiden holding, a, holding flowers who is often for some reason, uh, uh, who interposes between them. I don't remember the iconography. But you see her anyway, between the two. And then, uh, also accompanying Vima Akirti is this uh, guardian figure, like a Buddhist guardian figure, and a, a female attendant holding something, and so on. The next, please. On the other side, you see the Bodhisattva Manjushri, looking rather smaller and less impressive, really, than Vima Akirti, but that's the whole point of the painting. Manjushri, the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva, who's the Buddha of the future, is uh, accompanied by a, lion, by a lion, typically, and, and so you see the lion here on the right. Manjushri sits on a platform, unlike uh, Vima Akirti, is simply on a mat. And then Manjushri, the last slide, please. Manjushri is accompanied also by attendants, uh, other Buddhist figures, and by a monk and a Confucian scholar here. As I say, I'm not going to try to identify them all, but just show them. Okay, enough for that, enough for Li Kung Lin. Now, uh, briefly, I'll show a few works associated with two works, uh, Yang Bujer. Yang Bujer is well into the 12th century, a little bit later, uh, into, the, into the Southern Sung period, 1098 to 1169. He was a pupil of a monk artist named Hua Guang, who was m a member more of Su Dung Po, Su Shi, uh, and uh, uh, Mi Fu, and so on, but of that circle earlier. I was a painter of Blossoming Plum. Blossoming Plum is another subject that becomes uh, important to scholar amateur painting and is done by just endless, endless artists. And a very fine example, uh, as genuine as could be, accompanied by a quite believable inscription in the Palace Museum in Beijing is a hand scroll titled Four Stages of Blossoming Plum. And it's actually four paintings on four large sheets of paper showing the stages from the earliest plum buds to the full blossoming. Um, and um, uh, as a, a sort of chronological series, so to speak. And it's a fine, genuine work. I'm sorry I don't have the slides of I thought I had all of it, but they turn out to be two of the same sides of the same two sections. Anyway, here are two of them. I think this is the furthest along when the, bub, the blossoms are actually coming out full. And um, here is a de detail in which you see, again, as in the one tongue painting, there's a shallow depth achieved by having a nearer branch and a further branch which is somewhat lighter and, and textured rough brush. Uh, quite effective uh, thing, but sh only shallow, and, and uh, the two of them following more or less the same movement. <clears throat> and then you see here these quite beautifully drawn long, uh, long you know, twigs of the uh, blossoming plum, and these beautiful blossoms. Well, this is a whole subject to which one could. In fact, there's a lot of very fine work done by many by uh, Maggie uh, Bickford, uh, who uh, teach anyway. Uh, who's written a lot on blossoming plum and had a wonderful exhibition years ago. Uh, okay, next, uh, please. Here's the inscription that uh, Yang Bujar uh, has added to it. And uh, he, uh, it's, he, <clears throat> he actually tells what the subject of it was 
what subject of the painting is, and then at the end he writes his signature and uh, tells where he painted it in a certain uh, monk's hut, as he calls it. He was sojourning somewhere. Fine calligraphy, absolutely genuine, uh, showing the, the genuineness of the painting. Okay, the best of literati painting, that is, is often accompanied this way by other things. Also attributed to young Boucher, and maybe by him, is this little painting, next please, of a sprigs of bamboo. So, very simple, uh, unimpressive if you just look at it as a picture, but quite uh, lovely and evocative, and again, uh, it catches your attention and makes you think about the person who painted it. That's the point of it. So, um, and then uh, somebody over here has written this uh, this inscription attributing it to uh, attributing it to young Butcher, and um, it's, it, it's quite possible. Double double album leaf again in the Palace Museum in in Taipei. Um, well, you don't really need much of a painting that is to uh, to uh, communicate the what the this kind of painting is supposed to communicate the cultivated mind and hand of the artist. Okay, next please. Uh, I, I quickly show here, but then we'll we'll bring back later this painting, which is actually um, later. This this is later in the 12th century. An artist working under the Jin, the Jurchuns, who uh, occupied the north of China when the southern Song was done on the south. I'll talk about that a little bit in a later lecture. This is a painting by Wang Tingyun, a literati painter, literatus, singular, uh, uh, working out of the Jin. And it's uh, uh, an old tree in bamboo in a Japanese collection, the Fuji i Yurinkan in Kyoto. I did this in my Skira book and made it, made it into a major uh, example of literati painting because it so wonderfully uh, shows all the uh, varied brushwork and the in this case, a wonderful uh, what compromise between interesting brushwork and interesting uh, picture, interesting description. But I'll bring back and talk about that when the time comes. Um, now, finally, for this lecture, I want to show a painting by an artist who is not famous and who is not well recorded, Chao Jung Chang. We know him, in fact, mainly, maybe only, from the uh, inscriptions associated with this painting. He's an uh, early 12th century follower of Li Gong Lin, maybe related to him according to one theory as I remember. <clears throat> At any rate, the hand scroll attributed to him in colophones from the early 12th century, the first of them dated 1124, is this famous painting of the second ode on the Red Cliff, illustrating a text, a famous uh, prose poem by Su Dong Po, Su Shi. It was uh, Zhang Da Qian's from China. It was then in the Crawford Collection, and it was acquired by the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City. Larry Sickman, a good friend of Crawford's, they went around together quite a lot, traveled and so on. And uh, Larry Sickman managed to get this before the Met, the Metropolitan, acquired the entire Crawford Collection. So it ended up in Kansas City. You have, uh, Sickman wanted it very much, and it's a marvelous painting. I was had the pleasure of writing about it for the first time in the original Crawford catalog. I got some of the literati paintings to work on because I was somehow associated at that time with literati painting. Okay, now, <clears throat> uh, the style, uh, the, uh, b before I show the painting itself, I want to show this copy. Now, very interestingly, uh, a, a Japanese scholar named Itakura, Masaaki Itakura, has discovered in Japan a copy of the whole scroll composition cannot be copied after the same scroll because the scroll never left China, whereas the, cop the copyist, Kano Tanyu, Japanese, uh, Japanese painter, must have seen it in Japan. So there must have been another version of this. Well, the interesting thing is that the, the copy uh, uh, includes a section at the beginning, the right half of the present, uh, what's now on the screen, which shows the house of Su Dung Po. And as we'll see in the, in the, uh, when I read the poem, the poem begins by talking about how he went out from his house, uh, a certain place on the, um, um, uh, the uh, snow hall, as he calls it. And um, anyway, uh, Mas, uh, Ita could have published this in Koka magazine back in August 2000, and then did a paper in a 
big symposium, which I was discussing for it anyway. So then uh, you, uh, this means that this beginning of the scroll in the original, now lost, and the end of the scroll, which uh, we come back to the house and see it again, more or less to reproduce each other. So the scroll had a certain symmetry. Beginning and end, uh, Sudan Paul goes out of his house, and at the end he comes back to his house. So that is an important aspect of the scroll that now we, now we get back uh, from this copy. And then the second section of this copy, as you see, represents Sudan Po and two friends uh, venturing out on this moonlit night and buying a fish here from the fisherman and so on. What we'll see in the original scroll. Now here's the section of the scroll as it survives with this beginning section missing, but beginning with the section of Sudan Po um, and his friends. Okay, now the translation of the Red Cliff Ode. This Red Cliff Ode is one of the famous works of Su Dung Po, Su Shur, who by this time had become a much revered figure. And the, Su, and the Red Cliff Ode was one of his best known works. And every educated Chinese practically knows it, knows it by heart. A lot of them do anyway. And um, um, uh, so this, uh, it, it was a, a favorite subject. We'll see other versions of it. Uh, one by Ma Hudger later. Okay. At any rate, at the, the beginning of the of the um, of the poem, he re, uh, I'm reading it from a translation done by a writer named A. C. Graham, British, and it's published in an anthology of Chinese literature compiled by Cyril Birch. But uh, this is the second Red Cliff Ode, <clears throat> in which Sudung Po writes this quote: "In the same year, on the fifteenth of the tenth month, I went on foot from Snow Hall on my way back to Wingon." accompanied by two guests. When we, when we passed the slope of Huang Ni in the frost and dew, the frost and dew had fallen already. The trees were stripped of leaves. Our shadows were on the ground. We looked up at the full moon, enjoyed its radiance around us. And as we walked, we took turns to sing. At last I said with a sigh, I have guests, but no wine. And if I did have wine, there would be nothing to eat with it. The moon is white and the wind is cool. What shall we do on a fine night like this? Today at twilight, a guest said, I went out with a net and caught some fish with big mouths and little scales. They look like the perch of Pine River. But where shall we get wine? After we, re after we reached home, Sudung Po continues, after we reached home, I consulted my wife. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. Okay, here he is with his friends and uh, uh, at the beginning of the scroll. Now here in the detail, you see that the three figures are casting shadows. Why? The only time in Chinese painting, early Chinese painting practically, where the figures cast shadows. And of course it's because it's in the poem. Su Dung Po mentions that the moon is casting their shadows. Very unusual and interesting. Su Dung Po is shown here as always bigger than the others. The two guests are more or less alike and smaller. And here, instead of one of them bringing fish that he had caught before, as the poem has it, here they are buying fish from a fisherman in his boat on the shore, and then the fisherman and Su Dung Po's servant boy is uh, buying the fish. Okay, then here is a detail of that, and you see the boy leaning over and the fisherman reaching up over the big uh, and well, you can see this is painting. This is painting that follows the tradition of Li Gun Lin in being basically like Bai Mao figure painting and uh, drawing of the landscape in ways that is a little bit rough brush, not very rough but not really uh, notably skillful either, ink on paper. And as we go on then, here's the next section. Uh, the, 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 uh, the reader, viewer, and the uh, artist and so on are, are taken across the river uh, where, they, where there are pine trees, excuse me, willow trees, looking rather like willows, the kind of willows we saw in Zhao Lingrong and so forth. That is rather droopy and not, not beautiful and elegant as willows by an academy master would be. And here we see, again, uh, landscape forms that are flat topped and the sides going down, as in Tong, and then distant hills. This is all a kind of landscape that is much more developed in later times in the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, here's another further, uh, further version of it, a uh, further slide of it, rather. And you see in the lower left here, jutting angular rocks, and in the upper left, uh, angular forms. All this uh, kind of borrowed from Tong landscape as they knew it. The next, please. Here's the. Yes, here close up. 
The uh, is, what's interesting here is that a lot of dry brush, dry brush over wet, sort of built up brushwork. And this is the beginning of something very, very important. It will become the very basis of landscape style for the uh, for for the uh, literati artists. And uh, the inscriptions, as you see, are written here in just very neat characters on the painting, not uh, not dividing the painting, not separately. Okay, the next. Here, even closer, you can see the, the willows and the water swirling underneath and so on. Really fine and very much importantly anticipating later literati painting. Artists by, like Huang Gongwang and the Yuan Dynasty eventually need, needs on. Okay, then the next one, we come to the next section of the narrative. And Su Po writes, um, uh, So we took the wine and fish. No, no, here we go. After I reached home, I consulted my wife. I have a quart of wine, she said. I have been keeping it for a long time, in case you needed it in some emergency. And here we see Su Dung Po having visited his house briefly, uh, the absent father, uh, and uh, the wife and one of his children. And then down below here, a uh, horses in a stable and a feeding trough and so on, a uh, compound behind. Okay and a, 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 a fence, a woven bamboo strip. Generally. And Su Dung Po walks off anyway. Here he is in a detail with uh, the quart of wine in one hand and the fish in the other. So off he goes and his wife and children are left behind. Then we have a uh, transitional passage with uh, simply landscape. Several times in the scroll uh, when you have a break, a chronological break, uh, and you move into the future, the, the artist simply fills the scroll with landscape forms. And from this quiet passage of Su Dung Po's house, suddenly you have jutting rocks and it becomes much more exciting. And so we are taken to the place where Su Dung Po and his friends have gone on the river uh, on the, uh, to, to this place called the Red Cliff. The Red Cliff was associated in their minds with a great battle that was supposed to have been fought there. As I remember, the Su Dung Po got the place wrong and it was not historically correct, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and the actual Red Cliff is apparently not very impressive as a place, but that again doesn't matter at all. What matters is the whole concept, the poetic concept. Here's a close-up of the landscape uh, elements here, this cliff, and you might see some echoes of Su Dung Po's painting, rock painting, which looked rather like, a, um, rather like a clamshell more than a rock and so on. Uh, so, and be, in addition to references to Tang Dynasty painting, all of this is full of stylistic allusions and things that the cultivated viewer has to uh, has to recognize. Now, here we go. Here is uh, Su Dung Po and his two friends with their servant seated on the shore of the of the uh, river near this red cliff. And so he he, he the poem goes on. So we took the wine and fish and went on another excursion under the red cliff. The river flowed noisily. The banks ro rose sheer for a thousand feet. The moon was small between the high mountains, and stones stood up from the sunken water. Even after so few months and days, rivers and mountains, river and mountains were no longer recognizable. Then, then he goes on, I lifted the hem of my coat and stepped ashore. Treading on the steep rocks, parting the dense thickets, I squatted on stones shaped like tigers and leopards, climbed twisted pines like undulating dragons. So on. Okay, that, that's a bit later when he, we see him climbing the cliff. Here the, he and the two others are seated on the shore with their wine and here uh, closer up. Uh, wine cups and uh, things to eat in front of them. Their servant, uh, and again, Su Dung Po, almost like iconic Buddhist composition, the large figure in the center, the most important, his hands uh, crossed in a sort of quiet contemplation, and the two other figures looking at him and much smaller. Okay, then he, then uh, as, as you go on next please, then uh, again a passage that uh, fills the whole height of the scroll with landscape forms in a transition to the next section. And in the next section here, Next, please. Here we go. We see here in the sort of uh, just right of center, Su Dung Po climbing. He climbs up the uh, to the top and um, and uh, finds himself uh, above the red cliff. Okay, this is the um, 
I squatted on stones shaped like tigers and leopards, climbed twisted pines like undulating dragons, threw myself up to the perilous nests of perching falcons, looked down into the underwater palace of the river god. Neither of the guests was able to keep up with me. So you see him climbing alone here, and then suddenly a huge shift in space with a uh, another passage where the rocky form occupies the whole height of the scroll, and then suddenly we are up at the top of the red cliff, and we see this tree grove, first of all, a quite marvelously drawn tree grove. Here it is, yes. Oh, here's the detail of Sudungpo walking up. He picks up his uh, hems of his robe and walks up the path uh, all by himself, un unaccompanied by the others. And here, here at the top is the tree grove that uh, suddenly the artist does something very remarkable and, and powerfully effective. He d does away with the figure of Sudung Po and internalizes it. That is, we are seeing through Sudung Po's eyes. And suddenly we are up at the top of the cliff and gazing into this uh, dense forest or dense trees with twisting trees and various kinds of trees. And here, a wonderful passage, this is a detail of the tree foliage of the pine uh, needles and the uh, trees and the twisting trunks and branches of the trees through it. To do a, a passage like this uh, is quite an achievement to keep it from going uh, flat and dull and repetitive, to keep it interesting, in fact exciting, partly to with a sort of shallow depth, dark to light, sharper to dimmer. Uh, marvelously done. And uh, anyway, I, I've always made details like this just to make this point. It's one of the uh, one of the great achievements of the best of literati painting to be able to do this kind of thing. We'll see others. So then anyway, we're going on here, just past this, again, seen through the eyes of Su Dung Po. Uh, we are looking down uh, into a kind of maelstrom through this uh, opening in the cliff uh, and uh, up above, the up, far upper left now, you see the falcon's nest. And this is the point where Su Dung Po is, uh, becomes frightened. He said, <clears throat> he, the, his friends haven't been able to keep up with him, he says. And he says, I called them with a long slicing whistle. The grass and trees st uh, stirred and shook. Cries in the mountains were, were answered in the valleys, that is, echoes. The wind rose and the water seethed. I felt uneasy and dispirited, frightened by the eeriness of it. I shivered. It was impossible to stay there. Okay, so then he looks down to this, uh, as I say, kind of maelstrom, down into the seething water. And um, here we go. Oh, yeah, okay. Here we go. Yes, looking down. Um, he, and here's a nest in the upper part. And uh, we are actually as if turned, the, the space is radically twisted and we're made to look down rather perilously down into this down into the swirling water or here's another slide of the uh, the edge edge of this uh, uh, cliff and the uh, falcon's nest up top okay then another another transitional passage with the landscape filling the whole space and then uh, here just a minute yes then, oh, here, next please, we are out on the river. The jutting rocks that were seen at the far left of the previous image are now seen here, the rocks on the water and the, on the river swirling around them. And we see, um, we see Sudung Po and his friends out on the water. Um, we, here we go. We turned back, uh, to, uh, to continue his poem, we turned back and climbed into the boat, loosed it in midstream, and moored it where it drifted to a stop. At that time it was nearly midnight, and there was silence all around us. Just then a single crane came from the east across the river, with wings turning like cartwheels, white jacketed and black underneath. With a long, dragging wail, it dived at our boat and flew on westwards. Okay, and here you see that, the, the people, Sudung Po and the others, and the boatman and servant in the boat, the crane swooping down on them, and just otherwise just swirling water, uh, suddenly 
uh, in place of all these massive landscape forms, suddenly we have just water and the boat in the middle of it. And looking back at the crane, very dramatic and wonderful. And then further on here, um, uh, the Sudung Po, they, uh, they were brought to the shore again and were going to be at his house. Uh, the poem continues, The guests left at once, and I too retired to sleep. I dreamed of a Taoist monk who passed below, uh, passed below Lingao, swaggering in a feathered robe. He asked me with a bow, Did you enjoy your trip to the Red Cliff? I asked his name. He looked down and did not answer. Ah, I know you. Last night, the thing which flew past me, wailing. Wasn't it you? That's Su Po talking. The Taoist looked back at me, smiling. I woke with a start and opened the door to look for him, but did not see him anywhere. And that ends the poem, and we'll see now the end of the scroll. Okay, here we go. Uh, coming back to the shore after the red, after the uh, boat boat scene, uh, here is Su Dung Po that night, sleeping. You see him in his house, uh, both Su Dung Po sleeping and also down below, you see him confronting, you should be confronting a single Taoist, but for some reason there are two of them. I remember reading a lot of long discussion about why there are two instead of one, and in some versions of the poem there were two Taoists or something, but at any rate, leaving that aside. Now the interesting thing here, one of the interesting things, is that the house is seen very, very, uh, what, uh, symmetrically straight on and uh, flanked by trees, and the back of the house, or the compound behind, rises, as you see, the roofs as if it were straight up to the top of the scroll. Very archaic and very distinctive. All of this uh, enclosed by landscape forms, big ridges of rock or earth, and lots of trees. Where does this come from? Okay, uh, you may remember Wang Wei. Here's a detail from the rubbing from the Wang Chuan Villa. Uh, and here is Wang Wei's, uh, one of Wang Wei's uh, dwellings. And you see it open, and himself and a visitor inside. And you see the the, the building going upward, uh, meaning back, uh, uh, quite archaically, all very symmetrical, flanked by trees on both sides. So in other words, what uh, Zhao, uh, Chao Zheng Chong is doing is evoking or recalling this kind of Tang Dynasty uh, drawing of the house. Notice, by the way, two cranes in the foreground. In this case, the cranes mean long life, they mean good fortune, and so on. But it's somehow related to the cranes in Su Dung Po's period. Here's a close-up of the Su Dung Po bit. Now, notice that Su himself um, uh, is sleeping in the upper part, and then down below, he sits. This is his dream. Partly dream, partly is it dream, is it real? Uh, here again, you see things like the drawing of the roof and the rocks and the fence all uh, could be turned into something very repetitive, but instead is somehow interesting. And even the projecting um, projecting backwards roofs of the house up on the top of the scroll. Okay, and here, close up. Notice, by the way, that when he draws Su Dung Po sleeping, the drawing of the robes or the uh, coverlet is so quiet and smooth and so on, it very well conveys the idea of sleep. Uh, if, it, if it were done in more active brushwork, it wouldn't. And then in front, he sits confronting these two Taoists, all with a certain kind of amateurish uh, ease and yet, I mean, non-skill and yet perfectly suited to the occasion. And now the very end of the scroll, again, uh, another uh, another uh, uh, spur of rock dividing it from the final section. And in the final section, which you see over here at the far left, Su Dung Po comes out of his gate to uh, look for the Taoist who, of course, is not there. He, he had been a dream. Well, we, you or I probably would have Su Dung Po facing the other direction, out toward the the, uh, the left, but somehow uh, our artist turns the whole thing around and has Su Dung Po coming out. And down and below is this, um, down below is the last section of the poem. I woke with a start and opened the door to look for him, but did not see him anywhere. Okay, wonderful. Um, now, the style of this scroll represents, I think, literati painting at its best, really. The old orthodox technique is replaced by a new kind of technique without such obvious finish or skill, but a kind of unostentatious strength in design and execution that the Chinese connect with moral strength in the painter. 
But the curious thing is that we don't know anything about the painter. A recorded colophon naming Chao Jung Chong as the painter is now missing. The present first colophon is this one, dated 1123 by Zhao Lingzhi, who signs De Lin. I think that's right anyway. The colophones, the documentation of the scroll are all discussed in my old article on it and aren't really relevant here. At any rate, it's a, or the first colophon dated 1123. So it's hard to talk about this as expressive of the inner life of Chao Jung Chang. We don't know anything about him. In fact, he's a, a more interesting painter than the, than the painter of some of the things we saw earlier. Um, so um, this idea, however, of archaism, the awareness of the past, the concern for communicating some understanding, some sensibility to other people of like mind, uh, there's no, no no thought of anything that's dazzling or trying to call attention to himself by displays of self-conscious unorthodoxy. Well, this is a wonderful painting, and I, I wish we had a lot more of the best of literati painting like this.